Okay, good morning. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Um, I'll just launch straight into this. Uh, a few months ago, I overheard a five-year-old child in the queue at Costco. She asked her mum, what is an algorithm? Five-year-old. I had two reactions, great question from one so young. And what is the accurate answer? Now, the definition is only a quick Google search away, a process or set of rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations. The word algorithm, incidentally, comes from the name given to the ninth century Muslim father of algebra, al Khwarezmi. While us English Saxons were battling the Vikings with axes, the Uzbeks were inventing algebra. <laughs> Algorithms predate computers. We see examples of analog algorithms in school classrooms, teaching to strict lesson plans, to textbooks, even to scripts, are teaching to analog algorithms. The developed world have a complex school system where the early years pedagogy is based on learning to socialize, to learn through doing, and then building cognitive abilities such as literacy and numeracy through elementary, Cross-curricular study starts to give way to subject, to focused subject-based learning. And by secondary, most pupils have lessons of around an hour abruptly jumping from one subject to the next, moving to a timetable and separated by age. The attention of the system is on the secondary phase because the measure of success is the grades needed to get the maximum number of learners into university. Evidence shows that the early years are the most important in terms of changing life chances for children, and yet, of course, this is the most neglected part of our system. This is also a luxury model that is struggling in these countries to be affordable or sustainable as the number of graduates wanting to teach seems to be unable to keep up with the demand for teachers. It's also a model forged in an industrial era to teach content at scale. In recent years, more money, more teachers, and better leadership has managed to get this particular algorithm to deliver as many as 45% of pupils to a level of attainment sufficient to go to university. The rest, may have been bored and alienated, but hopefully picked up enough in school to get some skills training and a worthwhile job. We're now in an era where low-skilled work is under significant threat from the rapid development of intelligent machines. The normal model of schooling is therefore not only looking unsustainable in terms of cost and supply of sufficient teacher talent, it is also going to have to rapidly improve its ability to educate every child to a high level of skill. In the developing world, policymakers are still driven by measuring the success of schooling by the ability of children to recall enough content. This adoption of the Western paradigm of schooling is fraught with problems. How do you get enough good teachers to enable enough pupils to achieve the standard needed to get into university? This is essential to in turn produce sufficient graduates to feed employer demand to, and to become teachers for the next generation. It's a vicious circle. Now one apparently successful solution has been from the Bridge International Academies. This is perhaps the most extreme example I've found of a schooling algorithm at scale. This company is delivering low-cost education in some of the poorest countries of the world at scale and with good outcomes as expressed by test scores in literacy and numeracy. They are ruthless in driving down cost through economies of scale and standardized practice. This extends into the classroom where teachers use lesson scripts from tablet computers, as you see in this picture, with managers using the data to monitor the progress of each lesson. The problem 
of lifting primary education quickly at scale is being solved by commissioning experts to design the detailed process of teaching. But there is currently little clarity on how teachers will grow their autonomy as they gain experience and develop professionalism. Now, this approach may be the right one in some environments. Where there is no universal education, perhaps it is better than nothing. But it does also de-skill teaching and makes those workers vulnerable to being replaced by machines. They are being programmed, programmed like machines with algorithms, so why not replace them with machines that will more reliably follow the algorithm? As Arthur C. Clarke said in 1980, any teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. At the other extreme, Sagata Mitra is also trying to tackle the problem of learning where there are no teachers. He's investigating the potential of self-organized learning environments and a question-based curriculum. He has shown that by giving children shared digital resources, they can teach themselves how to use computers and the internet and thereby effectively acquire knowledge with adult encouragement and supervision, but with no trained teachers. It goes straight to a teacherless system rather than via algorithmic teaching. This has not been delivered at anything like the scale of the Bridge International Academies, but it does avoid standardization. It embraces self-directed learning, but with an unpredictability around how well it can work for every child. It delivers learning, but does it deliver education? This goes to the core question, and Abby suggested it, of what we want from schooling. Do we want every child to complete schooling and enter adulthood equipped with a canon of knowledge about a broad and balanced curriculum? Should they also have social skills of empathy, communication, and resilience? Do they also need to be creative and skilled in making things as designers, engineers, and performers? Well, of course, we want all of those things for our children. Aspirational parents will find money for tutoring where their child is struggling intellectually but also for ballet lessons, for sports clubs, for adventure holidays. Shouldn't every child have that entitlement? But try to shoehorn all of that into a standard school and ask a standard teacher to deliver that range of activity into a standard-sized class of, a mixed, ab of mixed ability pupils, all in a standardized six-hour school day, and you find it's impossible. As a result, we compromise and we must prioritize on what we think is important. Now, according to the Oxford Study Group, 35% of jobs in the UK, 47% of the jobs in the US will not exist by 2033, 2033 being the year that a child starting school this year in those countries is 20 years old and entering the labor market. How does a teacher, a school leader, or policymaker know with confidence what to prioritize if they're to prepare a child for that uncertain future. Artificially intelligent machines are already being engaged as solicitors. What will be left for pupils leaving school in 15 years' time? So is there an alternative model of schooling? Is there a scalable model that believes in every child, a model that every child can believe in? A model that finds and nurtures talent in every child, a model that wraps learning around the individual rather than a producer-led model designed around the average pupil. The work of Carol Dweck on the growth mindset has been popular with educators from traditionalists to progressives. She recognizes the constraint of a fixed mindset in learners where labeling a learner as a C-grade student becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. However, the growth mindset also believes that potential is realized when hard work and self-belief combines with great teaching. This, to me, suggests that standardized scores can be damaging self-esteem. Academic selection works well for those that are selected, but not for those that miss the cut. They then have to battle their own sense of identity as a failure as being below average. A whole education system 
is designed to test individuals against the average using a standardized curriculum. Those with the best scores go to the best colleges and get the best jobs. It is a talent sifting machine for a time when mass employment was low skilled and choking human potential was economically sustainable. The new skills requirements of our labor market demand a new system and the new politics of disaffected, de-skilled, underemployed former middle classes, today being the day we sign the Brexit uh, paperwork, makes this even more urgent. Elite sport moves us away from measuring against the average to comparing to the personal best. So could education do the same? In the end of average, Todd Rose argues that today we have the ability to understand individuals and their talents on a level that was not possible before. His attack on the Taylorist education system is devastating, concluding that traditional education systems violate the principles of individuality. He advocates genuinely individualized learning beyond the personalized learning we know that's designed to get more learners through standardized tests. He wants us to move from Taylorism to a tailored learning experience. His answer is to atomize qualifications into credentials, to replace grades with competency-based judgments, and to allow learners uh, more self-direction in their learning. This, I think, would create a more flexible infrastructure for the sort of teacherless system being explored by Sagata Mitra. Learners would be free to learn to their passions they could get credit for what they know, what they make, and what they can do. Their credentials become their individual learning playlist that needs no qualification wrapper. This in turn allowing potential employers to search beyond the blunt summation of a single grade and find the more precise mix of competencies that they need. Um, this flexible, I will speed up, individualized system may also be scalable. By harnessing a learner's passion, it's more likely to smooth the user experience between informal learning at home and formal learning at school. And the range of online and face-to-face -face learning resources would be used, including more peer learning, something I have passion about. But what is the role of the teacher in this model? And how can there be confidence that the self-directed learner is pushed to the best they can be by working hard to realize the potential of, the, of their individual talents. Uh, teachers have a place, uh, but one that smooths the experience between informal and formal learning. One that I think is more like the sports coach. Uh, the best tennis player needs a coach. Andy Murray is a better tennis player today than Ivan Lendl, but Ivan Lendl, uh, the coach has clearly learned a great part, has played a great part in Murray's rise to the top by his understanding of the individual. Elite performance has been generated by working on the right parts of Murray's physical and mental game. And this pedagogy, which exists in schools with sports teachers, uh, with art teachers, can be applied uh, to all learners. And then we will hear from Rose later on, um, her work around artificial intelligence and the new TA in the classroom suggests that enhanced data analytics coupled with machine learning functionalities offer the promise of significantly enhanced teaching ability to coach each individual in the same way that elite sports coaches are doing with athletes. So to conclude, the current system is failing too many learners in the modern economy. It is not financially sustainable, and whilst teachers are leaving the profession, child mental health is rising. A system that believes in and empowers every child is, however, possible. Much of the pressure of teaching can be relieved by digital algorithms that will also give teachers insight on their learners. And beyond the algorithms is what feels inconceivable to many. A teaching profession that can rediscover the love in their practice, in unlocking learning, and in helping children grow. Thank you very much.